Nancy Gibbs is the director of the Shorenstein Center and the visiting Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice of Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Until September 2017, she was editor-in-chief of Time, directing news and feature coverage across all platforms for more than 65 million readers worldwide, as well as editorial director of the Time Inc. News Group. She was named Time's 17th editor in September 2013, the first woman to hold the position, and remains an editor-at-large. She has also served as a consultant to CBS News and an essayist for the News Hour on PBS. She's the co-author, along with Michael Duffy, of two best-selling presidential histories, The President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity from 2012, which spent 30 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, and The Preacher and the President, Billy Graham and the White House from 2007. She has interviewed five U.S. presidents and multiple other world leaders and lectured extensively on the American presidency. Nancy was born and raised in New York City. She graduated from Yale summa cum laude with honors in history and has a degree in politics and philosophy from Oxford, where she was a Marshall Scholar. She has twice served as the Ferris Professor at Princeton, where she taught a seminar on politics and the press. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Erica, and thank you all for tuning in. As Erica said, I really would love to hear from you. All of my experience um, with this group in the past has been that I learned so much from hearing what's on your minds and hearing how you react to the things I'm talking about. So, as I said, I'm going to stop along the way um, to give a chance for questions, but also I uh, take no offense at being interrupted. So raise your hand and or put something in the chat and we can talk as we go. One of the reasons I'm most interested in hearing from you is that we find ourselves in this year like no other, a campaign like no other, on a road with no maps. And my natural professional bias is that information is everything, that the, the damage to our information environment has made everything worse and has made solutions harder. If you had asked me how the United States or the world, but particularly the United States would react to a global pandemic. I would have uh, recalled probably 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina or past national natural disasters and envisioned a kind of unity and common purpose, which is not what we have seen. Uh, the fault lines that have opened up in this country in the last six months are not new, but it's all the more painful to see them when we are facing such immense uh, health challenges, economic challenges, social, political challenges. And so what I want to explore is the role that uh, media in particular has played in how we got here and talk perhaps about some solutions for where we go from here. Uh, my theory of the case, naturally enough, is that uh, everything is connected that uh, the, the pandemic landed on top of intersecting crises having to do with the business model that has been an existential emergency for what we still call the mainstream media, along with the polarization of the public, the collapse of institutional trust, and the rise of misinformation, fake news, information disorder, whatever you want to call it, that these are all, these are all interconnected. And I don't think we can understand how we got here or find a way out without seeing the way these um, interact. If you, if you start with the constitutionally protected mission of the press, uh, which is to hold the powerful accountable, it is meant to serve as a public service. Uh, but it is also a business. And this graph captures as well as anything in one place the ways that it was a highly profitable business all through the 20th century, albeit with periodic disruption and competition between radio, TV, print, cable, the internet. I saw the end of the glory days and lived the apocalypse. But in the 21st century, as you can see, uh, the fact that it's also a business and now faces an extinction level event has affected its ability to perform its role, even at a moment of national crisis. The rise of the social platforms, you can see here, uh, Google's revenue, Facebook's revenue soaring, even as newspaper advertising revenue collapses, um, 
those two companies alone now account for 61% of digital ad advertising revenue uh, and 77% in local markets, which tells you one reason why at just the moment that we need local news the most, newspapers are disappearing at a terrifying rate. Between just in 2008 to 2018, uh, newspapers alone saw a 68% drop in advertising revenue. So what does that mean? That affects how journalists see the world and their place in it and how they do their jobs when that many newspapers die. In 15 years, more than half the jobs in the news industry have disappeared. Just for one example, San Jose Mercury News. In the 1990s, it employed 440 journalists. By 2018, it employed 39. And if you look at um, the, particularly the collapse of newspapers, I focus on those because of a kind of chain reaction. Newspapers are the boots on the ground. They are the way that we know what is happening in communities. They often are the ways that we know what is happening overseas. They drive the coverage on television, on a lot of um, digital platforms. When newspapers are starving, the whole information ecosystem suffers. So it's against that background that we have to think then about trust. You may remember long, long ago in the before times, as we were first learning about uh, a novel coronavirus, that everyone from the World Health Organization to um, the Surgeon General to Anthony Fauci were advising people not to wear masks. This is not that these experts were lying to the public. It was that when there is something new, uh, we have uncertainty about it. The scientific method suggests that this is how we go about learning what is true by trial and error, by exploring, by experimenting, by admitting to uncertainty. Our news environment does not allow for uncertainty. Uh, it punishes it. And so we have seen uh, in the last six months, particularly this serial collapse of trust in US institutions, including some that were among the most trusted like the CDC. Uh, it has led to a kind of crisis in expert communication the ability of people who shape policy, like many of you, to reflect the best data and evidence and build public trust in the solutions that you're proposing. It's much harder to propose solutions when scientists can no longer assume that once they figure out the science, including the science of a, around the pandemic, uh, that they can trust public leaders and politicians to respect that science or even understand it in setting policy. Uh, this has led to now a, this is new from the last week, of trust and information about the virus dropping dramatically, whether it's from the CDC, as you can see, has suffered one of the most severe drops, which is really a tragedy when you think about the importance of such a globally important public health institution is. Um, but also from the president and also importantly for my purposes from the national media that uh, barely a third of registered voters trust what they are seeing uh, in the media. This impulse to distrust experts, even committed public servants, academic authorities, reflects this reality that we no longer have a shared body of facts to consult. We have polarized into separate political identities so completely that betraying the beliefs of your tribe, your team, uh, is too high a cost, even when life depends on it, which is what brings us to polarization. Success uh, for public leaders, for private leaders, for even news organizations in a polarized world often means talking more about emotion and outrage than actually uh, about facts and reality and solutions to problems, which typically involves compromise, which is harder and harder to justify in a polarized environment. So problems get worse, which means trusted institutions decline even further, and you get this terrible kind of feedback loop uh, 
of a decline in trust feeding a decline in an increase in polarization and vice versa. And then remember the business crisis underlying this, uh, Facebook has, and social platforms have done as much as anyone to destroy the business model of the press. It's also true that their algorithms feed on emotion, feed on outrage, profit on feeding the forces of division. And so that further undermines trust and reliable information. So this is what uh, that polarization ends up looking like. This, uh, this slide, which is hard for you to, to read, but you can see the trend lines. What it suggests is that Pew Research Center has been asking people about their beliefs around 10 broadly political issues, um, immigration, national security, uh, how to best alleviate policy, um, and, and chopped up their answers based on how big a difference is there depending on your race, your level of education, your frequency of religious attendance, your age, or um, your party identification. And what this chart shows is that through the 1990s, through the early um, 2000s, that gap on race, religion, education, age, and even party always stayed roughly, you know, 10, 12, up to 15 points until about 2011, when you start to see, you know, this real explosion where now the gap in party identification defines people's political beliefs way more than any of these other identifications, way more than race, religious attendance, age, that um, people's partisan identity has almost become the, the dominant self-definition. And uh, one really concrete poignant example of this is, you know, a generation or two ago when you asked people how they felt if a son or a daughter married someone of a different religion or a different race, uh, that would often be something that would raise objection in families. Now, people care much less about a son or daughter marrying outside of their religion, outside of their race, outside of their economic class, the thing they care most about that would be um, most upsetting to the family is if your Democratic daughter married a Republican son or if your Republican son married uh, a Democratic woman. And so that speaks to the way I think in which partisan identity has now seeped into everything. And of course, we saw it seep into um, even something like what is the acceptable level of deaths in a pandemic, where look at the enormous partisan divide in how people answered whether the number of deaths in the United States has been acceptable or unacceptable. Once um, even something like wearing a mask became a matter of um, partisan identity, the odds of public health success went way down. And, you know, it's an understandable, very basic calculation. Do you have more to lose from being kind of cast out of your partisan circle, cast, thrown off of your partisan team, or from getting a disease that you've been led to believe is exaggerated by the media or, or um, does not actually pose such a great threat. It, it seems to me that while political scientists have studied negative partisanship, have studied the inclination of people to vote against the other party's candidate more than in favor of their own party's candidate, that notion of negative partisanship, it even implies, it turns out, to wearing a mask in the midst of a, of a pandemic. And so the fact that we now have uh, this kind of a divide over something that I think many of us might have imagined would be public health information is not red or blue, it's, it's more you know, science or not science. Uh, all, of these, all of these trends that we have seen around the pandemic, even though they reflect, as I said, longstanding trends in declining trust in expertise and in rising polarization, it still has been really remarkable to see the extent to which uh, even something like a global health crisis can trigger. And so this is what it looks like when you have a trust crisis and polarization. 
uh, the this graph shows that that even that Democrats trust many more different news sources than self-identified Republicans do. Um, even when it matters to where can you go to get your information. And this is where I think uh, the media has a significant responsibility in how news organizations have handled the last six months. Um, it's the nature of news to be drawn to novelty. And so uh, reporters wrote up every incremental scientific claim, even though traditionally we would never write about, for instance, uh, science that had not been peer reviewed. If, if my medical reporters at time had come to me, even with a really exciting, interesting new study about you know, cancer treatment that had not been peer reviewed, there is no way we would have run that story. It just would not have seemed responsible. In this environment, when there is so much fear, there's so much uncertainty, when people were desperate for uh, anything that provided any hope, it became much more common for reporters to report on preprints and non-peer-reviewed uh, scientific work, which given the fact that uh, academia already creates incentives for scientists to do kind of attention-grabbing work and to, to publish quickly, the pandemic strengthened those incentives, prompted uh, a rush of research all around the world that was published arguably before it was ready to be ready to be published. And it's very hard for either non-export expert journalists or non-expert readers to be able to distinguish between uh, good science and bad science. And so you've had even top medical journals having to retract stories that they had published in the under the pressure to inform the public in uh, at a time of crisis. And so that then gives us the perfect conditions for uh, the rise of misinformation around this virus. Low institutional trust, high polarization, business incentives to goose engagement, and then you have everything you need for misinformation to spread far and wide. There have been uh, estimates that health misinformation spreading networks uh, in five different countries generated close to 4 billion views on Facebook just in the last six months. Most people have heard some of these conspiracy theories, including the one that the outbreak was, was intentionally planned. Of those who have encountered a conspiracy theory like that, more than a third say that it's probably or definitely true. So the, the willingness to believe um, things that are, are you know, provably false has gone up so considerably in this environment of uncertainty, in this environment of distrust, in this environment of polarization. And this is not just a problem by any means in the United States. Um, in countries around the world, uh, authoritarian leaders have exploited this crisis to crack down on dissent of all kinds. In Hungary, Romania, Algeria, Thailand, the Philippines, uh, have instituted new laws, invoked emergency decrees, uh, giving authorities power to block websites or impose fines or imprison people for spreading false information about the pandemic. Even you know, social media users in some countries have been arrested after allegedly posting false news about the coronavirus, which um, creates a lot of opportunity to, to crack down on dissent of all kinds under the the umbrella of fighting misinformation. So what that means is that uh, you now have the sort of triple witching news events of 2020 of a, a pandemic driving an economic crisis, helping to trigger, trigger social upheaval, all against the backdrop of this extraordinary unprecedented presidential campaign. The, the increase, and then I'm going to stop after this at this slide, the increase in polarization and the rise of digital media has created a new kind of political news consumer. Uh, I was struck by all through the last presidential election, how many people would come up to me and say, you know, I never have really thought of myself as a political junkie. I never really followed political news that closely, but now I can't get enough of it. I 
uh, I'm addicted to it. I start my day looking at Twitter and I have 10 newsletters in my inbox. And what ends up happening is that you have um, people who read much more, but arguably know less about what is actually going on in, across the political landscape. In what ends up happening is that we all are searching for for each new scoop that reaffirms our views, even if uh, that scoop is actually a distorted vision of reality. It is not that the media landscape that I grew up in was by any means perfect, but it produced and distributed critical forms of truth seeking, of facts, of expert opinions, of uh, including you know, lively disagreement that I think are essential to maintaining healthy democracy. Uh, that system is collapsing and what is rising in its place is a perfect platform for distortion, for manipulation, for uh, what look like political news sites that actually bend reality and that don't just reflect partisan divides but end up driving it. So let me stop there and I'll actually stop uh, sharing so that I can see people. And anyone who'd like to uh, ask a question about any of these, I've thrown a lot out there. So um, we have some questions from the Q&A that we can start with. But if you have a question that you'd like to ask live, please uh, use the hand raise button and we will work through those as well. Um, I have a question for you back on the graph that you showed. Um, someone is wondering, why you think 2011 was the uh, where the gap started to increase and did social media have anything to do with that? Uh, that's a great question and I'd love to, I think there are a lot of theories of the case, but certainly um, even though, you know, Barack Obama in 2008 was sort of seen as being, and actually the split is coming before 2011, but you really see it accelerating. And while Obama was seen as, you know, the first really digital campaign in 2008. They certainly leveraged digital tools to turn out the vote, to reach voters, to drive voter engagement. Um, it's amazing to realize that uh, he was not tweeting uh, and that, that particularly Twitter, but also Facebook are so young in the, in the scheme of what we're talking about. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to the platforms in a second, but, but I do think that, that more than anything, they have so uh, dislodged the, the way that most people traditionally got information and processed information and replaced that with a mix of very valuable, personally targeted information. They created ability for people to find one another to organize politically. They greatly democratized information, all of which have the potential to be hugely positive. You know, when Mark Zuckerberg is being raked over the coals, he will always talk about Facebook's mission being to connect people. But there is just no question that these platforms also have enormous powerful to damage fundamental foundations of democracy. And we are wrestling with that now in these coming months. I think we will particularly see that. So I am inclined to uh, place the lion's share on, on the platforms directly or indirectly. When I say indirectly, they have so much to do with undermining the mainstream media and with, with driving uh, traditional news organizations down a road that has also not been healthy in their desperate search for scale and for engagement. Um, the sheer volume of content that the average reporter today is expected to produce is astonishing compared to if you were a newspaper reporter or you know, a White House correspondent in the past, you might be expected to report a story every day. You weren't expected to add five live upside, uh, updates to your newspaper website while tweeting, while blogging, while Instagramming, while you know shooting your own video. I mean, the, the, the need for every reporter, you saw the shrinkage in the number of reporters. Everyone is having to do so much that doing it well becomes 
so much harder. And I say this at a moment where we have seen really heroic, extraordinary investigative reporting go on um, all over the place in local newsrooms and in national ones. But the environment in which reporters are working now is uh, exponentially more complicated than it was even 10 years ago. And we have several questions around digital platforms and social media. Um, so I think you said you're gonna address that in the next part, should we? Uh, well, let me live... show you. Let me just uh, show you this amazing. It's just an astonishing picture. The combined market cap of just Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple is bigger than 190 other countries, and that kind of power is um, is is unprecedented in uh, in the history of capitalism or in any uh, I think regulatory environment that that you would have these companies that would have grown so quickly become so powerful so quickly without frameworks to address them so at the Shorenstein Center we've had a two year project on um, regulating the platforms and uh, that was led by a former uh, FCC chair, Tom Wheeler, who proposed uh, a new regulatory agency to for, you know, a digital regulatory agency because existing antitrust, their, their conviction is that existing antitrust laws just aren't sufficient, that the, the speed of change and innovation with these companies is so rapid that uh, you need an agency that can also be equally nimble and sort of informed by a duty of care, but that can adjust its frameworks um, at digital speed. And I think without something like that, it's very hard to imagine. We're seeing, we're starting to see um, overseas, other countries being much more willing to uh, address these challenges, whether it's around data privacy or or even the economic challenge posed to news organizations. Many of you, um, if we have any Australians on the call uh, in the middle of the night, um, Australia is, is pressuring uh, Facebook to be compensating news organizations for the content that it, um, it benefits from without having to pay to produce. And they're in a sort of a game of chicken between the Australian government and Facebook about whether Facebook will just stop posting news, you know, sort of from reliable news sources in Australia. And they argue thereby deprive Australians of access to reliable news so that what's left is, is the junk news. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of debate, particularly God knows in these months leading up to and coming out of the next election about the, the public interest responsibility of these platforms, how well they're performing it, uh, and what an appropriate regulatory framework looks like. Uh, the challenge here, which is really familiar to many of you, is um, just a knowledge gap. And anyone who has watched some of the recent hearings with the leaders of these companies um, can just see that the, it, it, it does not feel like a fair fight. And one of the things I'm proudest of at the Kennedy School are the number of students and faculty who are working hard in the space of public interest technology in order to have public-minded leaders going into government, going into the public sector, in order to provide expert insight and guidance about how these powerful tools can be used to the public good and how we can mitigate the, the harms. And I think those kinds of, of technology-minded public leaders are absolutely crucial to us uh, finding a way forward. Great. Um, we have a question. Um, do you think the media would have fared better if they had immediately started charging for online content right out of the gate rather than giving it away for a while and then switching gears? That's a great question. Um, and it's, you know, in a way, it's the original sin of uh, the early leaders who were so uh, unfamiliar, as we all were, I mean, in the 1990s. What is this internet thing? You know, the uh, some media CEOs at the time described it as a black hole because they were just pouring money uh, 
into launching websites and developing digital strategies without having any idea of sort of what the business model would be. And so, you know, it was, it, it I think seemed obvious and natural that you would, uh, you would, you would just transfer the advertising model um, of free content that's advertising supported, which had, you know, largely defined traditional media, why not just um, move that over to, uh, to digital media. And of course, that proved to be disastrously misguided. Because once you had uh, first Google and then Facebook, who are so much better at it, that, which is to say, they are so much better at targeting Procter & Gamble's ad to the audience that Procter & Gamble is trying to reach than the New York Times or CBS News could ever be. And so the, you know, the price of these ads uh, kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And the, uh, the ability to target was increasingly the, the domain of the, of the platforms who have such incredible deep knowledge into people's interests and habits and, and, and personal data. So I, I think anyone would say if you could go back in time uh, having a paid content model would have uh, arguably been a much better way to go. Having said that, if you look at a place like the New York Times now, its uh, subscription revenue has now crossed over its advertising revenue. It is not that the two combined are not lower than the two combined once were. It isn't that the increase in subscribers has fully offset the collapse in print advertising and the failure of digital advertising to make up for it. But it is true that the, that the business model of the New York Times now is more dependent on serving its readers than serving its advertisers. Obviously, you know, everyone is, is in some way having to do both. There are all sorts of sort of ethical challenges that arrive from that. But there are e even challenges to that public mission of journalism I'm talking about in being uh, subscriber driven. Because the temptation is to give readers what they want. And that can mean, you know, a lot of news about Kardashians for some places. It can mean, uh, you know, the New York Times benefits a lot from how many people want their recipes and their crossword puzzles. And uh, the recipes and the crossword puzzles underwrite having foreign bureaus and doing uh, the kind of hard, difficult, expensive reporting that the Times and other places view as their public mission, but which is not profitable. In fact, quite the opposite. It's uh, particularly reporting, you know, foreign news on difficult topics, reporting on a humanitarian crisis someplace in the world uh, can be very dangerous. It can be very expensive. And the marketers will tell you that it is a turnoff both to readers and advertisers. So the willingness of news organizations to cover stories that we might objectively say need to be told, um, the business incentives, whether advertiser driven or subscriber driven often work against those. And those tensions between the mission of the press and, the, and its profits and not just profits, but survival are, are very much in conflict and even shifting the balance towards readers rather than advertisers will not fully solve that problem. Uh, we have a question around, uh, so we have, uh, as a public servant addressing the psychological impact of the pandemic, what you say and how you say it matters. So the number one rule of crisis response is to have a trusted source providing accurate information in a healthy way. Uh, I, the commenter, I believe in science and facts and it is offensive to have the health of the nation and the world teeter on political agendas. Will we ever see the media align for the greater good? I mean, that's a really interesting question. Uh, there's a new Pew poll uh, that just came out last week about the public view of the press and how it's doing its role. And it's very grim. Um, it, it does not think that most reporters are serving the public interest, acting in the public interest, uh, that, that even, even absent malign intent, that there's been an institutional failure uh, on the part of the press. And I, this is something, this is one of the reasons that I came to Harvard to teach and to, and to study and to try to figure out ways to address this. And, and it goes back to everything being intersected. I think 
unless we get to a, a way that uh, news organizations are not um, at, at risk of extinction, it's going to be much harder. Uh, if, if the choice is either a kind of pandering to a lowest common denominator or, or fueling outrage and division or going out of business, you know, that's, you know, that's a, a terrible choice to be making. And so you're seeing a lot of creative work being done around nonprofit um, business models for news, uh, around other ways of funding news that will particularly help solve the local news crisis. There were more than half of the counties in the United States, more than 1,500 counties, only have one local news source. So the county I live in, which is Fairfield County, Connecticut, has about 35. There is no absence of local news if you wanna know what's going on in your individual town or community where I am. More than half the counties, there's one, and in the most cases, that's a weekly. And what happens when these newspapers die is all sorts of downstream bad effects for democracy. Public spending goes up, public corruption goes up, polarization goes up, accountability goes down. Um, so we have got to figure out a solution to the local news crisis. And I, you know, I think local news is sort of the vitamins of democracy. I heard it described that way once, which I think is, it is what nourishes uh, community and nourishes democracy. And, and the national news too, obviously is hugely important. I think it has been uh, this president's decision to um, characterize national news as the enemy of the public, the enemy of the people has set a terrible trap. Uh, and it's very easy for reporters to walk into it where uh, if they push back on that character characterization, say, no, we're not the enemy, of, we're not the enemy of the people, then that can be characterized as, as criticizing, undermining uh, a partisan attack on the president. On the other hand, if they don't push back, then, you know, they become what um, many have said, then they're just stenographers. If you just you just say our job is just to uh, publish whatever the president said yesterday and not push back if we believe what he said was not true, then you get this, you get this kind of vicious cycle. And the charges of bias and partisanship have always existed. Uh, there are a lot of biases in media, not all of them. In fact, arguably for a long time, most of them were not partisan biases. They were more biased in favor of conflict. Um, in favor of novelty, even in, in favor of the negative. I think part of the, the trust problem I talked about reflected uh, news organizations pursuing their jobs uh, really fervently and with a sense of public purpose to hold public institutions and public leaders accountable. This is very much a post-Watergate phenomenon of that the mission of the press was to expose corruption, to expose malfeasance, to ex expose incompetence in, in government, uh, in the public sector, generally in the private sector as well. Well, what happens if you have a whole generation of journalists who grew up on a Woodward, Woodward and Bernstein model is that uh, a lot of, of stories exposing institutional failure will land on the front pages. It's not that those stories are not valid and valuable. The problem is that if those are the only stories or those are the main stories, why should we surprise, be surprised if people come away thinking that all institutions are failing and that bureaucrats are lazy and corrupt and all of the negative caricatures of government that we have uh, seen in the last 20 years. And yet there is a certain kind of allergy among reporters that uh, you know, I was often fighting against in my own newsroom about writing about good things that are happening, that that was sort of seen as soft, that you're doing a puff piece, that you're sucking up to some leader that you hope to ingratiate yourself with down the road. It's that the phrase is beat sweetening, that you were sweetening the beat that you were on by trying to, by writing a, a, uh, a suck up story about this or that public leader. So if, if any positive story about a solution that could be scaled about a, uh, uh, a governor who has come up with some creative early childhood education intervention and implemented it in his or her state. If those don't have the same allure and traction and resonance in newsrooms, if those are somehow seen as less worthy 
than exposing a corrupt uh, program in that state. You're going to get this artificial imbalance between how much is working and how much is not, how many uh, solutions to public problems are being tested and explored versus how many problems are we failing to solve. And that, uh, I think, was, a, was an entirely inadvertent uh, accelerator in the decline in trust in institutions that it's really incumbent on us. And there, there are journalists working hard on this. There's a whole solutions journalism network that works to encourage newsrooms to, uh, to be looking for creatively, deliberately going out and looking for solutions to problems and, and writing about them in the hopes that these things can scale. I spoke with a, um, a former chief technology officer of the United States who's doing really creative work in looking at community organizations that are addressing technology um, solutions to public problems um, in underserved communities that are that are trying to tell the stories because stories are what are so powerful to tell the stories of things that are working all around the country not just in silicon valley not just you know in route 128 not just in our technology hubs um, but but all over the country in places where you might least expect them. I think those kinds of stories, especially right now when people are so dispirited by what we have seen in our public life have never been more important. Great. Right, we have one live question, someone with their hand raised. So Lucia, unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks Erica. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, fascinating. I have a question in terms of trust and in terms of how things have changed. Um, at the beginning of this epidemic slash pandemic, uh, um, I was following a lot the WHO, the World Health Organization uh, media briefing to try to understand, I'm a scientist, so to try to get some data, some facts on what was really going on, as I've done in the past for other similar situations. And I noticed that uh, at least the opening speech um, of the media briefing were very um, sort of maybe Twitter-like or social media-like. Uh, there was quite a lot of um, empathic type of discourse. So I'm wondering whether you notice differences in, um, in this media briefing, either for WHO or maybe other institution, that affect the way the actual uh, data and uh, facts about the pandemic, including the utilization of masks, has affected how the media have taken up this, uh, this type of information. Thank you. So just so I, to be sure I understand, are you saying that, that those WHO br briefings were much less scientific and data-driven and more sort of anecdotal, emotional, empathic um, in the-, in yes. the Yes, exactly. It was all about solidarity. We will fight this with solidarity. Solidarity is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But I, I was looking for more uh, evidence-based, yeah. Yeah, you fight disease with science. Um, and I mean, it, here, you know, that's a, in a way, it's a great example of the kind of asymmetrical battlefield where a lot of the public health institutions, I think, um, realized that they were up against very effective communicators of bad information. And that the, that the bad information, the false information, the misleading information, some of which was uh, driven just by people looking to make money, either selling some snake oil or, or to drive engagement on their site uh, that they could monetize. There were all sorts of, um, all sorts of reasons for people spreading health misinformation. But but many of them were very good at it and very good at um, using appeals to, to fear or to emotion um, in order to, to build that engagement, to capture people's attention. This is all about attention. And whether it's the CDC or the WHO or any other, any other science-based communicator, uh, I think they, they were trying to fight on the same battlefield and it's one to which they are you know, that isn't their, their training or expertise or, or even what we need most from them. You know, we, as we say, we need the science, we need the data. But there also needed to be um, way better kind of public service announcements and, and public communication around, around the science, around uh, disease mitigation. If you think about the 
early weeks when we were all just trying to wrap our heads around the fact that the world was shutting down, um, in some ways it was remarkable how quickly people did embrace the, the facts that this is a genuine threat. This is not just another seasonal flu. This is not just a cold. It's going to take um, dramatic action in order to prevent uh, even more catastrophic um, results from this. That the, there were large majorities in this country of people who, who saw this as a threat, you know, stayed home, socially distanced, everything. Uh, and even mask wearing, which um, it would have helped if there had been, been more consistency around mask, mask wearing. I understand that this was sort of, it's been called a noble lie on the part of the WHO or the Surgeon General. They were worried about uh, having a run on masks that would have um, made it even harder for, for frontline healthcare workers to access the supplies that they needed. Um, I don't, it wasn't that they, noble lie is a bit of a harsh term for it, but to the extent that their motivation was more to prevent hoarding than because they were certain that mask wearing wouldn't help, you know, it was not unreasonable, even if we didn't know much about asymptomatic spread then, it wasn't unreasonable to think that, well, it couldn't hurt to wear masks unless you were afraid of hoarding. And so there were communications failures that I think were well-intentioned and that where the science was uncertain, other motivations, even you know, admirable ones entered in, but all of that just had the effect, you know, two months later when it was clear that asymptomatic spread was a huge part of the problem, when it was clear that mask wearing was gonna be one of the most effective interventions, it was so easy for people to say, well, wait a minute, one minute you're saying we don't need to wear masks and the next minute you're saying we do, how can we know anything? How can we trust experts? How can we ever know what's true? Um, as though new information isn't always something that may change guidance, may change our understanding of things. So all of which is to say, I think that the, the, a lot of the public health officials uh, recognized early on that they were up against uh, kind of invisible adversaries that were spreading all kinds of misinformation very effectively and very quickly and we're trying to speak in as popular and accessible and even emotional a way as possible, rather than trusting to fact, trusting to science to um, be sufficient in what they were communicating. And, you know, it's kind of a tragic what we've seen downstream of that. Uh, we have just about 10 minutes left. So Nancy, I wanna make sure you have time to finish your slides or are you no, the only to take some uh, questions? I won't go back to the slides, but the one last maybe hopeful, maybe not hopeful point that I will make has to do with misperception, which is really interesting research about how much this very divided um, country uh, is partly divided because of just not understanding what we actually believe. And so there's a group called More in Common that's done really interesting research uh, around people's beliefs on all sorts of issues. And what they find is that um, people think many more people on the opposing side of the political divide, if you think team red, team blue, um, hold extreme views than actually do. Uh, it's, it's not at all uncommon for people who identify on the left to think a majority of conservatives believe certain things when it's actually only a small minority that do. And the opposite is also true, that, that on the right, people think a majority of the left is you know, uh, in favor of defunding the police or wants totally open borders, uh, particularly around issues like immigration, issues around race. The, what people believe about the opposing side is it's a very distorted view of what the other side actually believes. And here, because I always will bring things back to media, uh, the more media people consume, especially the more partisan media, the bigger the misperception gap. The people who actually have, you can test your own if you go to more in common and you look at the perception gap, you can take a quiz that lets you see whether your view of uh, the views of the other side are ac how accurate or, or inaccurate they are. And by and large, the people who have the most accurate view 
of the people who they disagree with are the people who consume the least media. Well, here's a challenge to us then, because uh, I wrote a piece this weekend in the Washington Post about uh, how we move forward, what any kind of political reconciliation looks like. And one place where it has to start, it seems to me, is, is allowing for complexity, is allowing that people can change, that they can uh, hold one set of views and then evolve to a different set of views or that we can agree on some things and disagree on other things. All these things that seem really, really, really obvious, and yet we've lost the ability to do this because partisan identity has, has taken such hold of us that, um, that allowing for that kind of complexity where I love these things about you, but I disagree in these things about you, that that has become so much less uh, acceptable in our, in our current political environment. But I think closing that, that perception gap is one of the really critical measures in getting to a point where we can talk to each other again and not just be yelling at each other all the time. Uh, we had a couple questions about um, the international scenarios. Um, so uh, I'm just pulling from one, is the trend you observe in the crisis in trust in the US media consistent with what's happening in democratic, democratic countries around the globe? Uh, I haven't seen side-by-side -side research and, and doing global research like that is really uh, difficult. The closest I've seen is the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is worth looking at. They publish it every year, usually in February, and they look at trust globally. And, um, and many of these trends are consistent in, in democracies around the world. The, the one interesting thing has been that even as trust in a lot of public institutions, not all, but some public institutions has declined, uh, trust in private sector leaders in many cases has gone up. And you're seeing uh, on issues often like uh, the environment or even some social justice issues that we traditionally think of as being kind of public sector issues that people are increasingly turning to private sector leaders to be um, addressing those issues and have more trust like in their own employer to, to address these issues successfully than they do in their government, which I think is an interesting kind of role, role reversal. But the, uh, the trust problem is, is certainly not unique. It, there is a fascinating trust gap that aligns with income where uh, higher income people tend to have greater trust in institutions generally and tend to have greater trust in individuals generally than lower income people do. And you know, that kind of high institutional trust partly has to do with what their encounters with, uh, with government or with the police um, or other you know, representatives of the public sector look like. But there are, you know, there are significant downstream uh, impacts of the fact that trust is higher among wealthier, more educated people than it is with the general public. Great. I think we probably have time for one more, so I'm going to combine these two questions. Um, should there be a common definition and standard for organizations that label themselves as news organizations versus political commentary? And how can we get to standard, a uh, standard of consuming journalism rather than sensationalism? combined with would it be helpful to somehow regulate or require truth in advertising so people know the difference and understand what they're watching is not actually news so the really interesting question that you put your fingers on i think one of the things that has really contributed to the decline in sort of the standing of the press which has been the blurring of news and opinion of news and commentary and you know, this was a wrestling match in my newsroom where um, reporters believed that it was essential to their success and to their personal brand that they be on Twitter, but Twitter lends itself to hot takes and to uh, expressing as sharply and pungently as possible your point of view. If you're a White House correspondent, if you're a national security correspondent, if your job is to report on what's going on in the agencies, then uh, surely it undermines your credibility as, a, as an objective uh, reporter on those institutions if you are also tweeting uh, your hot take about whatever the latest political headline is. And 
So, so even you've seen enormous fights within major news organizations about, um, about bias, about social media practices, about um, even whether objectivity is possible or desirable, um, which is, it, it is sort of hard for my generation of reporters for whom the idea of, of objectivity or if fairness is a, is a better word, which doesn't mean uh, being uncritical. It doesn't mean not pursuing, trying to get at the truth, but trying to be, um, to be scrupulously fair and be mindful of, of one's own blind spots. All of this has been up for debate in these past months in, in newsrooms. And so I think that the, the blurring of news and opinion, which, you know, I'm inclined to blame uh, the nature of cable television for, anytime you see a panel of, you know, four talking heads, it's very typical for one to be, you know, a White House correspondent from a major news organization sitting next to a political operative, sitting next to a columnist. So the columnist's job is to have an opinion. The political operative's job is to get their guy or girl elected. And the, the correspondent's job is to find stuff out. Those are three very different missions. If they're all sitting next to each other on a desk on CNN or Fox or MSNBC, why should we be surprised that people would conflate the, um, what these people's jobs are and how they go about them? So I, you know, I think that there are all kinds of, there's all kinds of need to, to separate again um, where, you know, who it is, who is whose job it is to find things out uh, and who it is where this is, you know, this is my point of view. This is the reporting I've done. I think transparency is a big part of the solution. This is how I came to, to know what I know and be writing what I wrote. Here, here's my evidence, here's my data, here are my sources. And then let the reader, the viewer judge, you know, do I find this person credible? Do I find this data persuasive? But the more transparency um, and the more rigor sort of brought to bear, I think uh, is, a, is, is a significant contributor to being able to restore some of the lost trust.